Hello, and today we have the great opportunity to catch up with Science Gallery Venice's first artist in residence on the Earth Water Sky programme. Earth Water Sky is dedicated to the environmental arts and sciences working together. Emma won the award in 2019 and came to Venice twice uh, in the summer and in the winter and as an artist in residence based with us. So we're now going to learn what she got up to and also, but first of all, where she is now in the process of making the piece, which will be shown in during the Venice Biennale in 2021. So Emma, welcome to Science Gallery Venice again, virtually. Um, <laughs> And we'd love to see an image of something you're working on at the moment, which is part of the residency program, which at your, in your year was dedicated to the subject of water and dedicated particularly to working with Professor Carlo Babanti, who was part of the ICE Memory Project. So it's dedicated to ICE. So let's see the first image. So Emma, what are we seeing here? What are we actually seeing here? And what part of the process is it in? Okay, so we're currently looking at um, a film still from some footage uh, that I shot at the beginning of the year. Um, it's a dancer um, working underwater and I worked with two dancers and a freediver. And with the research that I did during the residency, we worked together to choreograph some, some movement which is going to form the final film piece. And this is a film still from yeah, the footage that we shot in January. So how does this relate to Ice Memory? How does this relate to your work with the Ice Memory project? Dancing underwater and ice cores, how do they relate? So um, yeah, the, the idea just came from thinking about um, the bubbles of air in the ice core and um, how these bubbles that they find in the layers of the ice contain histories and stories um, from you know, many years ago, which is what the, the scientists are um, looking at and, and researching. And I was, was thinking about that in relation to, um, to vis you know, working visually. And so in the, the film, the, the figures are like the air trapped in, in water. It's obviously water as opposed to ice, but um, so with the choreography, they are, um, we worked with lots of narratives and research from the cause and from this developed um, movement. So this is what they're performing in the water. And the movements actually are based on atmospheric changes. And I wonder if, which you discovered with um, Carlo Babanti, and I wondered if you could describe how they relate to that. So yeah, the, the choreography was um, based primarily around um, this beautiful um, live animation that Carlo Barbante showed me right at the beginning of the residency, which um, shows the movement, the global movements of air and particulates and water that are move, moving, continuously moving around the globe. And what I was really interested in um, when looking at this footage is these, these, the movement and the interconnected interconnectivity of everything and how um, the, the world is, is connected through these, these kind of movements. And as Carlo explained to me, it's how toxins from a mine in Chile, for example, ends up in a glacier in Antarctica. So particulate enters the atmosphere and then it's taken, it's trans transported via air or water um, to another part of the globe and then settles and then ends up in these layers of ice. And that was one of the moments really of inspiration right at the beginning of the residency um, that really kind of got me me thinking um, about what well, it was something that I just really wanted to start working on thinking about how uh, we are all connected through um, through the atmosphere of the earth and the ice cores are a brilliant way of uh, thinking about this and and the, and although they're kind of um, seen in these kind of layers in the ice. Uh, 
that's in in one location what you're finding is is uh, particulate from all over the globe which is just really fascinating and how did you come up with the idea of actually dropping dancers rather than aquatic performers into water? You made your life really difficult. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I ended up working with two dancers and a free diver um, so that they could help help each other, really. <laughs> um, pri primarily, we, we talked a lot about whether to work with free divers or dancers. And I think it, movement is, is so important. And... Um, it was just great to work with people who were, you know, obviously very versed in the language of movement. And so um, I wanted to work with dancers during the process of the research as well. So um, we took, or I took some of the research, the papers that I'd been uh, looking at to workshops with dancers and we explored this through movement. Um, so that was really fantastic for me as a, as a way of um, animating the research of making meaning with the research um, thinking through it creatively and then the idea of them um, taking this into water was thinking about the body um, suspended in water being like a bubble of air suspended in ice so um, like the ice um, that tells stories holds memories from from an ancient past these bodies are suspended in water and they're telling the narratives that we're exploring so how did you select the dancers? Um, so we did a, a series of uh, workshops, um, two in Bassano. It was both a process of working through the research and auditions really. So um, as we discussed a lot of the, uh, a lot of the work, a lot of the research and kind of uh, explored that through movement. And then from those two workshops, we selected some dancers and then those dancers went to um, Y40, which is this the deepest indoor pool in the world, which is just outside of Venice. Uh, and we, uh, with those selected dancers, we um, gave them some basic training in freediving. And then we did another kind of workshop uh, in the water with those dancers. So it's a kind of two tier process. And then from that, I selected two dancers. And then there was a freediver um, who uh, I wanted to work with as well so she could work at depth and also they could help each other so when we were working together with the choreography uh, it was very much a kind of process of helping each other out and so the free diver was uh, Ayako was fantastic in, in helping the, the dancers and, and vice versa so it was a real um, collaborative effort effort really it's fantastic but it was it was tricky and on all respect to the dancers because it was incredibly hard so that I mean that was a six month process wasn't it really yeah. from audition um the workshops then selection then actually doing it just before the lockdown and the pandemic yeah. uh, uh, just around Christmas time January um so at this point, you've got mounds of footage. <laughs> yes. where, yeah. Do you know where you're going with it? What's it like <laughs> to be in the middle of this process at the moment? Um, it's never an easy place to be. <laughs> it's one that's kind of, yeah, both kind of uh, scary and exciting at the same time, really. Um, it's it's a tricky one, but it's but it's really you know it's a, it's a great place to be. It's very exciting. So I'm I am yeah literally going through all of the footage uh, at the moment, and uh, I've got some music that I'm working with and kind of just making sketches at the moment, trying to work out the shape and the form of it as well. Um, but I'm also writing because there was a lot of research um, that took place over that um, over my time in Venice. Well, it was it was when I was back in between the two trips as well. So there's a lot and lot of conversations with scientists and talking with different people. I was interviewing remotely people who live close to glaciers, asking them about their experience of, of the retreat. So I'm pulling information from lots of different sources and that's all been settling somewhere subconsciously and now I, i'm trying to write so that will also be part of it and for me at the moment i feel that the writing will help shape the edit of the um the film footage and the, and the music so that's where i'm at at the moment I've, i'm making sketches to try and um get my myself into it to start working with the footage quite visually um and i'm um, sorry physically rather than visually um, and then now I, I will start writing.
<laughs> so you're in the middle of the mess. The middle, middle of the mess, definitely. So if we scroll back right to the beginning, um, why did you apply for the residency when it came up? I, um, I guess there's two, two main things really. One, um, for me, I've worked underwater for many, many years and the opportunity to work with ice. So thinking about water in a different form just really intrigued me at the time. It's not something that I've done before. Um, so it just really sparked something. I kind of thought this would be really exciting. Although I've ended up in the water again, it's very much triggered from a very, very different um, place, which is really, really interesting and really exciting. It just kind of pushes me into new experiences, which is great. Um, and then also I, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to hold um, a bit of an ice core a few years ago uh, at British Antarctic Survey as part of um, another residency that I did. And it was a really poignant moment um, having this uh, piece of ice in your hand that you know is you know thousands of years old and listening to the, the cracks and the pops of the air expanding and knowing that that's ancient gas releasing in your hand was just like, I don't know, it really kind of, captured my you know captured me the moment was just really incredible and at that point I thought I'd really love to do something with that but had it's one of those things those t things happen moments happen and you kind of log them and think and then sometimes projects come along and you're like wow okay so it was a it was a beautiful fit I guess for me in that sense for those reasons and obviously the opportunity to spend time in Venice which is a city that I love very much obviously surrounded by water um, and you know it's such a, a critical place in terms of the climate the emergency at the moment as well so yeah there were many reasons <laughs> and you had the opportunity to work with professor carlo babanti and the ice memory team who are based at cuff oscary yeah. uh, who are the big partners with science gallery venice and founded it um and I wondered, what have you learnt which has really sparked your imagination from Barbanti and the team? What has made you go, wow, when you have one of those wow moments? I think, um, perhaps, I mean, it's in quite in a, not necessarily an inspirational, well, it is an inspirational, but it's quite negative, I guess. But um, the, the fact that uh, glaciers, um, so when a glacier stops moving, it's classed as being dead. So that's um, that's how they class it. And uh, I, I just hadn't realised that the majority of the glaciers in the world are dead. So when they don't, there's not enough mass, so they're not um, growing enough for them to be moving down the mountain. So they're retreating or, or not moving at all. Uh, yeah, then they're dead. And that, to me, was just a huge... Um, signifier of how critical the moment we're in is that it, it's kind of we're not at the stage where you know glaciers are behaving normally anymore it's it's kind of there's a retreat happening um but for hundreds of thousands of years they've all been you know going through a cycle of, of um growing and this movement kind of down the mountain uh but that that's no longer there and i just i hadn't really when i you know discovered that i just hadn't hadn't realized how you know far down the line we are but it was also, it was actually an inspirational moment creatively in the sense of thinking about a glacier um, as an animate being and um, this idea of, of the glacier being, you know, dead. It's kind of anthropomorphizing it in a way. And that's something that very much comes into the work, um, the way that I'm, I'm thinking about developing the work. And how has it, inf I think it's influenced it in another way as well, thinking about the body of ice, hasn't it? Yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. In terms of, um, so the, I, the sort of premise of the film is thinking about an ice core uh, being the post-mortem of this glacier and uh, analysing it, you know, look at, looking at the events that led up to its death. Um, and so, yeah, that, that kind of all very much fed into th this idea um, of thinking about the body, the body as a glacier and, uh, and thinking about um, how we value nature and humans um, and th that relationship and how I, I was really interested in um, Iceland they um, held a funeral for a glacier uh, which is one of the, the biggest most important glaciers um, died a few years ago and what was quite interesting is that uh, at the time 
when it was classified as dead, not, not much happened around it. Um, there wasn't much press or anything like that. And then this couple decided that it was they, that we, they should hold a funeral for it because it was actually really um, quite a momentous thing to kind of mark the passing and mark this event. And once this funeral was held and it was recorded, the press, if you kind of look for it now, you search it, there's loads of press about it. So the process of, of kind of, like I was saying, anthropomorphizing it, holding a funeral for it, having this kind of very human uh, acknowledgement of the glacier meant that we, as humans, we've then taken interest. So I was just really interested in, in that as well. Um, and that that feeds into to the to the work into the, the way that I'm kind of um, I'm structuring the piece. So yes, because of an autopsy, without giving out too much away, yeah, yeah. see features in the piece. Yes, actually, in the end. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. So yeah. So thinking about um, yeah, this the the idea of an autopsy. So this examination of the ice core. Is, is looking at the body of the glacier. So that's a bit of a tantalising clue <laughs> for people to watch out for when they see the piece in May 2021. Yeah. Um, so what is very striking about your process is the research which you go into in, in depth. And as you've already indicated, you worked very closely with Carlo Babanti, but you also went further afield and went to different cultures uh, who are situated near glaciers. And I wondered if you could describe and say why you did that, what drove you to do that as well? Definitely. Um, for me, something that was quite, I just became quite interested in from the start is, is uh, the idea of, of multiple narratives. So when scientists are looking at the cause, they, um, they're, they're going in looking for something from the outset so, so they're, they're looking to find something from the outset and so I often was asking well what do, do you ever happen to find you know something as you go along or like how do the um as you're analyzing it do you how do you draw the history like what parts of history are you recognizing are you looking at how do you find that when you're so so for example you find for volcanic ash and then you can date that that's a good way of, of dating um or finding a date line in, a, in an ice core um but i became really interested in in whose histories are being told and by whom and uh and often not always but often the scientists aren't from the local area where the glacier is and uh the the histories that are being told are relating to events that are, are not necessarily close to the, the glacier itself and so I really wanted to think about different ways of knowing uh, so there's the analytical scientific way of analyzing the ice core but also ways of knowing thinking about this, the glacier just from from living close uh, to the glacier and this day-to-day -day knowing through experience and through living and so I wanted to um, find stories and narratives from people who live close to the glaciers and include that in the research because I felt that was very important as an, another way of telling the story of the glacier or the stories of, of the glaciers. So um, I, there, were, there are a couple of people particularly um, that got in contact. There's a, a woman called Patty Amaz um, who lives in the Andes mountains and uh, close to Kalkaya ice cap. And so I've, I've, she's conducted remotely some, well, I've conducted interviews through her remotely uh, with people who live close to the glaciers. They're very, very kind of um, minimal questions at the moment, but I want, that's something that I also want to develop at the moment. And then um, there's um, a guy called Rob, um, a professor, sorry, uh, Rob Marchant, um, who uh, has worked a lot in Amboseli uh, with, with Kilimanjaro and uh with communities around Kilimanjaro and he's had uh he's been out for two visits there I mean he's he's worked with these communities over many many years and knows people very well and he also conducted interviews with them so it was wanting to pull um yeah stories out uh from people who are experienced this glacier retreat on a, on a daily basis have you got an example of a story which you've been told which has moved you on the I think it's actually thinking about, um, so although they are 
that then the what was quite interesting is that communities aren't living right next to the glacier that you can see see the glacier but actually where they're living is is remote but they're noticing the droughts and they're noticing how that water the water table is being affected um so it's kind of it, it wasn't what i was expecting in a way i was expecting stories that were relating to ice but actually they're very much relating to water and the everyday living and and the, how the trees and the crops are growing and and that kind of so there's this visual so visual notice you know noticing that the retreat is happening in the distance in the glacier but also there's a very immediate uh result of that in an environment that one doesn't associate with the glacier at all um so yeah i was i just found that quite quite interesting in the way that they're talking about this yeah the salt in the earth and um the trees responding and and uh the water tables and that kind of thing so yeah it, it was it was yeah it's been really interesting and so yes as you say it's all about interconnection and mm. all the kind of almost melting away a lot of the assumptions which um we have culturally but also yeah you may have had as well when you went into the project absolutely and thinking about i think particularly when one thinks of ice cores we think of layers of history in a chronological way and actually history is isn't like that at all and uh that again that's something that's very much in my thinking when I'm making the work is this idea of interconnectivity and movement and non-linear histories. So histories depend on who's telling the story and, and where they begin in that, you know, in their experience. And that's, yeah, that, that's something that I'm, I'm kind of playing with and thinking about in the text um, is, is this kind of, yeah, non-linear uh, way of, of looking at time. And also space, it's all about time. Space. Yeah, yeah. So what's the next steps for the process for making it real in May 2021? Um, so next is, as I say, writing, that's, that's definitely next step. And then that will help me understand the, the shape of the work a lot more. And then I'll go back to the footage and start working with that and the sound um, around around the the shape that the structure that i've formed with the text um yeah and then edit that together magically <laughs> uh and then i'm thinking about it as a multi-screen piece so once i've kind of pulled that footage together then start working uh space thinking about it spatially although that that's always kind of there when i'm working anyway but um yeah for me the installation is really important and the kind of the spatial experience in the exhibition so although in my studio i've kind of got a big blank wall so i can project at scale so i'm not just looking at it on a screen it's very much about yeah the experience of the installation itself so once i've kind of got more of an idea of yeah of the structure and, and kind of again i'll probably make sketches that's kind of normally how i work and then i think about it at scale and stand in the space and place speakers around and that kind of thing and then go back so it's a lot of back and forth and how will it feel to bring it back to venice where it all began yeah great i'm looking forward to it um definitely um yeah because it's obviously it will be a long it uh, will have been quite a long time since i was there last it was quite an intense period with going back and forth and then doing the choreography and then the filming and and so having this time away is actually really good for the work. It's really nice to have that space, but it also means it's it's even more exciting to go back because you've had that break um, from it and um, chance to kind of breathe and let the idea settle and you've made something and then, yeah, coming back to present it will be, yeah, great. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, that's part of the deliberate process of um, and the way the Earth, Water, Sky residence has been constructed, that you have a a two month residency which can mm. up and then you actually make the piece after the residency when you're away so you have yeah. that split and gap in time and you can take as long as you can take within that next following year so that's obviously been really productive for you and i wondered if you could describe it even a bit more that kind of gap in space because people don't understand or appreciate how um intensity followed by space away actually works for an artist yeah i think it's very much about letting things settle and it's very much about the subconscious 
Um, so I guess this, yeah, it was really, really intense in terms of the research. I, I, I've got like three sketchbooks full of writing and drawings and stuff. So it was kind of like a very much, very like a sponge kind of like pulling in everything. And at the time, well, this is the way I work anyway, it's, it's very, very instinctive and you just follow different paths and they kind of feel potentially at the time quite disparate but then you realize that there's this, again it's a subconscious instinctive thing really that there's quite often an underlying thing that you're following without you knowing it at the time and then obviously things certain things fall away and you realize what you know it starts taking shape I guess it's almost like sculpting just looking at my hands <laughs> doing this that you're kind of chipping away layers and then you'll find you know you realize what's less important and you start kind of getting down to the kind of, of the nub of, of what you're you're really interested in and so having that space where the information um, yeah you're, you're not overloading with information but you have time for those thoughts and ideas to settle uh, is really important and then just having time to think because there's a lot of reading and there's a lot of talking so that it's quite active uh, in in the research process which is fantastic but it can be very it's very stimulating and less there's less room for kind of creative subconscious thinking to happen so having that space and time to kind of like to not almost try not to think about it then that's kind of where I think it starts to kind of take shape and form and you start realizing um the trails of thought that you have been following in a more prominent way um and then start working with them mm. yeah that's a brilliant way of describing the kind of instinctual side mm. which takes over after you've done the in-depth research during the residency so we very much look forward to seeing the final piece in whatever shape it comes <laughs> yeah. in uh, May 2021 where it be exhibited in Venice as part of Science Gallery Venice. Um, and with thanks to Fondation Didier and Martin Prima for funding the whole residency programme. And with thanks to Emma for being the first artist in residence on the Earth, Water, Sky programme. So thank you and look forward to seeing the piece in 2021. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to make this work and do the talk. It's been fantastic. Thank you.